flow homology. So today I'm going to talk about uh, knot flow homology and concordance. So today um, we're focusing on knots in S3. So uh, here's a, a Hagar diagram. Uh, what beam manifold does this describe? S3. Yeah, this describes S3, and moreover, um, it's like a standard sort of Hagar splitting for S3 in that sort of, well, this alpha torus, it is just sort of a solid torus sort of standardly embedded in S3, and well, I've isotoped the beta curve slightly, but that is sort of also just sort of the standard um, torus that kind of goes out towards infinity and comes back. Great. Okay. So this is describing S3. And so now the claim is I can describe a knot in S3 by just adding one extra bit of data to this diagram. So if I just put a second base point, and I'll choose to put it here, uh, the claim is that this data, so um, a surface, a, um, surface of genus G, uh, G alpha curves, G beta curves, and a pair of base points. Well, the claim is that this is going to describe a knot in the three manifold. And so how does this describe a knot? Well, the rule is um, let's connect Z to W in, so I'll do it in the surface, um, but away from the beta curves. Um, and then I'll push it slightly into the beta handle body. And then uh, let's connect W to Z, but we'll do the same thing, but with respect to the alphas. So in sigma minus alpha, and then push slightly into the alpha handle body. Okay. So let's do this in this picture. So, um, okay. So I want to connect uh, Z to W missing the beta curve. Okay, so let's see, we can go around this way. And then if I go around the back, and then if I come around this way, I've followed my instructions. <coughs> Great, and now I want to connect W to Z um, missing the alpha curve. And so this is where, so, um, we have to get the crossings, right? Because the crossing data is important in determining a knot. And so, well, the alpha handle body is like on the inside, right? So here, um, you should think about this. The first curve I drew is like slightly outside of the surface. And now what I'm drawing is slightly on the inside. Um, so this here is going to be under here. Like this. Great. Okay. And then if you stare at that knot, um, so let's, if you stare at that knot, it looks something like this. Uh, yes? Ah, right, so since um, today, oh, great, the question was about admissibility. Basically, could I put the points anywhere? Um, and so today we're working um, with knots in S3. And admissibility only comes into play um, when you have uh, V1 uh, non-zero. So for S3, and in fact, for any rational homology sphere, you don't need to worry about admissibility. Other questions? All right. So now I was in the process of drawing this knot. I think it looks something like this, if I haven't messed anything up. Um, great. So it's meant to be a trefoil. This looks like a trefoil. It's alternating. It has two crossings. Great. Okay. Questions? Yes. Ah, great. So the question was about uniqueness. Um, so is there a unique way to connect them? <coughs> um, and the answer is yes. Um, okay, so another way to think about this Right, so let's think about, say, on the inside, right? So on the inside, well, it's this torus, and I had this, this um, so basically this condition of missing the alpha curve basically means that on the inside, I'm missing those disks. And on the inside, well, if I'm missing the disks, what's left is going to be a three ball, 
And so basically, I'm connecting them via an unknotted arc in the three ball, and that's unique up to isotopy. And that's happening on either side of the surface. Um, so yes, uh, this does uniquely specify a knot in our three manifold. And also, <coughs> um, any knot in, a three mani in any three manifold admits a doubly, which we call the doubly pointed Hager diagram. It's possible that maybe you need a very large genus Hager splitting for your, for your three manifold. So for example, some knots in S3, you need more than just the genus one Hager diagram in order, in order to describe them this way. Um, but every knot admits some such diagram. More questions? Yes. Uh, so the question was, can you relate the minimum genus of needed for such a description to the genus of a knot? Um, I, as far as I know, they're independent. So for example, any torus knot admits a genus one um, the double pointed Hager diagram, but torus knots have arbitrarily large genus. Um, but one, you could just define a measure of complexity of a knot. Well, what's the minimum you know, uh, genus you need for a double pointed Hager diagram? Um, and that's you know, some interesting measure of complexity of a knot. Other questions? <coughs> Great. OK, so now, now we're going to play the same game that we played before. Great, so we're going to build a chain complex out of this. So now I'm going to tell you about the knot flow complex. Great, OK, and you basically do the same thing. So it's going to be a chain complex. Well, you sort of do the same thing in the sense that the generators are still going to be intersection points between this alpha torus and this beta torus and sim g. Um, OK, but now, OK, so remember before we were working over the polynomial ring F or join U, and the variable U counted how many times we crossed our base point W. Well, now we have two base points. So one way to deal with that is to just have two variables, one that counts the base point W and one that counts the base point C. So um, work over F or join UV. And then the differential is going to look exactly the same, except for this extra um, bit about the second base point and the second variable. So just usual, so counting points in some zero dimensional moduli space. And now u counts um, how many times you cross the w base point, v counts how many times you cross the z base point. So, so the point is you can analogously define um, a subspace of sim g using the base point z instead of the base point w, and that's what this is counting. Um, so this is what the differential counts. Okay. So let's look at an example. Um, so let's look at that example, which I'll redraw over here without the knot. So we'll have three generators for our chain complex. So I'll call this um, A, B, C. Great. <coughs> All right. Boundary of A. Yeah, great. I saw, saw Jacob holding up a zero. And in fact, we, this, we did an example like this on the first day where we just didn't have the base point here. So it's actually going to be the exact same calculation, but now the one disk that crosses this base point now is to get counted with a V. So if you remember, well, right, so from B, there's this disk here. So that's going to kick out a UA. And then there's uh, this disk here. And so now it's crossing Z. So Z gets counted with a V. So that's going to kick out a VC. And the boundary of C is zero. Great. OK. And so now, I guess now for the first time all week, I'm going to say something substantive about gratings. So for knots in S3, there's actually a way to compute absolute gratings. OK. So, wait, so let's put a little table. 
Right, so this is a bi-graded chain complex. We have the u gradin and we have the v gradin and I guess we also have the, Al the Alexander gradin which is just one half the u gradin minus the v gradin Okay. So let's think about what happens if we set v equal to 1. Right, so v is the variable that was counting how many times you crossed the z base point. So if you set v equal to 1, that's saying, well, we can still cross the base point, but we're not counting it any differently than if it weren't there. So setting v equal to 1 is effectively ignoring the z base point. So this is, this is basically saying ignore z. Okay. Well, z was just what was, if we ignore z, right, then this is just a pointed Hager diagram for S3. So we bet, so in particular, if we set v equal to 0, we better get out something whose homology is giving us hf minus of s3. And in particular, I, I declared for you the, the absolute gradient on hf minus of s3. I declared that the element 1 in there was in gradient 0. Okay, so if you set uh, v equal to 1, this should give you something that's homotopy equivalent to cf minus of s3. Um, right, so if I set v equal to 1, then you can check that... Um, Wait, so this is going to give us f join u. And, okay, so I guess it's an exercise for you to check that if you set v equal to 0, this homology is going to be generated by a. Generated by the element a. Oh, oh, I mean, like the generators of this chain complex are these uh, points a, b, and c. So I'm saying that, yeah, a, a is equal to 1 in here. Oh, oh, sorry, 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 yeah. You set v equal to 1. Yes, yeah. Set v equal to 1, great. And then you, um, exercise is for you to check that if you set v equal to 1, well, you do indeed get the correct homology, and it's generated by A. Okay, so that, the, so that's going to, so that was, we set v equal to 1, so we like threw away v, and we kept u. So that's going to tell us the u grading of A is 0. Okay. And then what else can we use? Well, um, this is a graded chain complex, right? So, so when you set v equal to 1, right, then this is telling us that, well, the boundary of b is ua plus c. So this tells us, since this is graded, this tells us that ua and c have to be in the same grading. And remember, we declared that the u grading of u is minus 2. Um, so what is, what is the u grading of c going to be? Uh, wait, so I saw some, it's going to be something like 2. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be minus 2, right? Because if this is in grading 0, well, that means that this, this is in grading uh, minus 2. So that means that c is in grading minus 2. And our boundary um, lowers grading by 1, so that tells us that b is going to be in grading uh, minus 1, because it has to lower the grading by 1 to get something that's in grading minus 2, so it has to be in minus 1. <coughs> Great. Okay. Well, you could also, instead of setting v equal to 1, you could set u equal to 1. Right? If you set u equal to 1, well, then, that's using a different base point, but it's still giving you back S3, and we still know that the element 1 in HF minus of S3 should be in grading 0. So, um, right, so then it's an exercise. Uh, so, compute the V gradings, analogously to how we did here, but just instead of setting V equal to 1, set U equal to 1. I'll tell you the answer so you can check your work. Great. And then, well, you can also compute the Alexander grading, so this is going to be 1, 0, minus 1. Okay. And so this lines up with the, with the gradings that I put up on the board on Monday. So that's how you can determine those. Great. And then, well, right, if you set uh, u and v equal to 0, this is what gives you hfk hat 
And this is the um, invariant that categorifies the Alexander polynomial. Questions? Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. So the question was, um, which variant of novel homology is CFK minus? Right, so this, this is sort of this full chain complex over um, F adjoining UV. And then um, if you set, if you set V equal to zero and take homology, uh, that gives you um, HFK minus. Um, was there another question? Oh, yeah, so the question was why is it hard to get absolute gratings? And um, for, the, uh, for knots in F3, um, hopefully I convinced you it's, it's not too hard. But you just do this process. You set V equal to 1, compute homology, find the generator for HF minus of F3, put that in grading 0. And then um, what, I, what I implicitly claimed without any justification is that the differential is sort of can help you determine the gratings of everything else. Um, you could have the issue that maybe not all of your generators are connected by differentials. And then um, in that case, there's a formula for the, to compute the gradings. Um, once, so you, you can figure out the grading of one element. And then if you, um, the difference between the gradings of any two other elements, um, you just look, uh, so you look for some uh, disk connecting them. And then you look at the, um, uh, Bounce love index of that disk, and then minus uh, N W of V. And so then this formula is going to let you compute the gradings of any other generators. Great. Okay. Um, so similar to the three manifolds invariant, um, this invariant behaves nicely under orientation reversal. Uh, so. Uh, let minus k denote, uh, I'll have this denote the um, reverse of the mirror image of k. OK, so reverse means change the string orientation, and uh, mirror means change any overcrossing through an undercrossing, and vice versa. And then, well, the knot flow complex of minus k is uh, the dual of the knot flow complex of K. So you just look at homomorphisms over a ground ring. Uh, from your chain complex over a ground ring. And then um, it also satisfies the current formula. So the knot flow complex of a connected sum of two knots. Um, is a uh, chain homotopy equivalent to the tensor product of the chain complexes of the respective uh, components. Great. All right. Okay, and so one of my favorite things to do is to use this invariant to study um, not concordance. So now I want to tell you what not concordance is. So any questions before I move on? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, if you don't do that, you get a chain comp. You know, so the question was, to get HFK minus, we set V equal to zero and take homology. What if you don't do that? Yeah, then you get a chain complex over the polynomial ring F adjoin UV, whose chain homotopy type is an invariant of the isotopy class of your knot. Um, that's like, it's like, if you don't set V equal to zero, you have, you know, what presumably is a stronger invariant because it has sort of more algebraic structure. Um, F adjoin UV is not a PID, so it's like, finitely generated modules over that are like not classified. Um, great. All right. 
So let me tell you about concordance. So Q naughts, K naught, and K1 in S3 are not concordant, which I'll denote with a twiddle. So I'm denoting it like this because this is going to turn out to be an equivalent solution. Um, so if they co-bound a smoothly embedded annulus, in S3 cross I. So, so the cartoon picture is that, okay, so maybe here's S3 cross one, here's down here is S3 cross zero, and then up here you have one, down here you have K naught, and then you have some some annulus like this. Um, great. Okay, so to see that this is an equivalence relation, well, to see that it is reflexive, you can just take the product annulus. To see that it is symmetric, well, you just turn this thing upside down. And to see that it's transitive, well, I'll just take two of these things and stack them on top, and then if you care, you parameterize it so it's S3 cross I, but I don't really care about that sort of thing. All right, so let me, um, certainly if two knots are isotopic, they're concordant, because you can just sort of take the isotopy in that direction. Um, okay, so let me give you maybe an interesting example. Uh, so let's take this knot. And so I'm going to think of um, the I direction as like time. So, so maybe this is what we're going to see in um, S3 cross 1 and then I'll move, I'll move down in the I direction, and we'll see what we see at each different like, um, cross section for different, for different values of T, which is the I direction. OK, so first let's just do an isotopy. Right, and so if I just do an isotopy, well, that's still just going to be sweeping out a cylinder in S3 cross I. So I started off, so here is a sort of like, what, the, what this is just sort of me telling me abstractly what the surface looks like. So I've just done an isotopy. So um, the surface just sort of looks like a cylinder so far. And now, well, let's bring these two pieces together. OK. Right, so topologically, this looks like a wedge of two circles. Um, so here. Well, what I'll, what I'll see here, something like this. Great. OK, and now, um, next, well, let's have these like split apart, but in the opposite direction that they came together in. Um, So now if you look at this, this is now a two-component link. There's one component here. There's another component here. And so in terms of the surface, well, now, it's, now we see this, right? And now if you stare at this link that I drew very small at the bottom of the board, well, this is actually the um, two-component unlink, right? So this is, a, this, this is the two-component unlink. Okay, so we'll, uh, since we can cap off one of the bounded components of the disk. Wait, so topological, so what I've drawn for you, right, this is a um, uh, home, diffeomorph, let's say if it's everything smooth. Well, this, this is going to be um, an annulus, right? So what I've just drawn for you is the concordance from um, the square knot to the unknot. Questions? 
Oh, it doesn't the singular. No, you, 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 could, you could have smoothed this out so that, yeah, so it just looks like, yeah, like a pair of pants. Great. OK. Um, so that's the definition of concordance. Um, OK, we say that k is slice if k is concordant uh, to the unknot. Um, and an exercise for you is to check that k is slice um, if and only if k bounds a smooth disk in the four ball. Um, so what do I mean by that? So by that, I mean um, think of think of S3 as the boundary of B4. So, four, the boundary is S3, and okay, I'll draw the knot K as an S0, and then K is going to bound some disk here. Great. Okay. So, I'll keep this. So we have this equivalence relation. So now, well, we, we, can, look, we can look at knots in S3. OK, so there's a natural binary operation on knots, a connected sum. If you look at knots in S3, another operation of connected sum. Right, so this is a set with a, um, a billion uh, binary operation. Um, is this a group? If I just look at knots in S3 up to isotopy, um, under, yeah, so if you look at knots in S3 under isotopy under connected sum, it fails to be a group. Um, one way to see that is um, that genus is additive under connected sum, and the only um, knot with genus zero is the unknot. So if you have two non-trivial knots, i.e. knots, whose genus is strictly positive, well, won't have an inverse. But the, the fix is, OK, well, if we mod out by concordance, um, this is going to be a group. So this is called the concordance group. Um, great, so somehow up to concordance, everything has an inverse. So an exercise is to show that um, the inverse of k, inverse, is, okay, appropriately enough, what I've been calling minus k. So remember, minus k, well, right, this is an abelian group, so it's a natural way to denote the um, inverse. And wait, minus k, it's the reverse of the mirror image of k. So. For example, yeah, all of my knots are oriented. Um, yes. Ah, oh, great. So Paul asked, does the proof of the exercise go like this? And the answer is yes. And so if, if this doesn't make sense to you, then your exercise is to make sense of this. Great. Other questions? Good. OK. So now, now what's our goal? Well, our goal is going to be to use um, the not flow homology to study concordance. So, great. So we have this bigraded chain complex. Okay. So, and so, well, just like in the in the three manifold case where we said nice cobordisms induce nice maps on the Hegel flow homology of your three manifold. Well, the same thing is true here. So. 
any cobordism between knots, so even if it has genus, we'll do some map on the knot flow homology, but concordances, which are particularly nice cobordisms between knots, are going to induce particularly nice maps on the knot flow complex. So, uh, cobordisms between knots. Yes. Ah, so the question is, how do you see the inverse is unique? And so, well, I guess you can check. It's unique up to concordance, right? So just say, OK. I taught intro to proofs last year. So how do you show uniqueness? Well, assume you have something else, and then check that it actually has to be concordant to minus k. That's another exercise, if you would like. Great. Another question? Oh, the question, if you sh the statement was if you show it's a group, then the inverse is unique. Yes, that probably also works. Great. All right. So, cobordisms between knots induce maps on this chain complex. And, oh, when I say maps, so I, I mean um, uh, module maps, so they, they respect the U and V action. Um, and concordances i.e. Uh, genus zero cobordisms in S3 class I induce especially nice maps. Great. Okay, and so now I guess I should tell you what I mean by especially nice. So we have the following theorem uh, due to Ian Zemke. Okay, so if k naught is concordant to k1, uh, then there exists a um, bi-gradient preserving uh, f adjoin uv uh, equivariant chain map. from the knot flow complex of K0 to the knot flow complex of K1. And moreover, um, it induces an isomorphism if we invert U and V. So we get this chain map F from the knot flow complex of K0 to the knot flow complex of K1, uh, and this thing, an isomorphism on, okay, so I'll just write uh, UV inverse for HFK, right, so this is, um, okay, so take the homology of, well, Take your chain complex and invert U and V, so tensor with F adjoin U, U inverse, V, V inverse. Right, so this should look a little familiar to you from, from the statement about three manifolds last lecture, right? So you get a chain map that induces an isomorphism once you've inverted all your variables in tight. Uh, oh, yes. Thanks. Yeah, I just wrote complete nonsense. Great. Thanks. Other comments? Questions, corrections? Okay. Great. Um, oh, maybe one thing to observe, right? So, um, since uh, concordance is symmetric, right? So, remark well, if K1 is, con K0 is concordant to K1, then K1 
K1 is concordant to K0. Um, so it also exists uh, G going the other way. One to K0 um, inducing isomorphism on uh, this localized homology. So, so if you have a concordance, you get maps in both ways with this property. Yeah. Oh, yeah, what is Asia Claire's out in a declaration? Yeah, I'm just defining, I'm defining this thing to just be this. Yeah, there's a definition here. The question was, if you compose concordances, the maps compose, and the answer is yes. Oh. Um, sorry. Yep. Uh, the question was, we have F one way, we have G the other way. Can you say anything about the compositions? Well, just in general, you can say just whatever is implied by the statements on the board. Um, uh, if you know things like one of them is a ribbon concordance, if you know what that is, then you can say um, stronger statements about that. All right. They are, in general, not inverses of one another. So for example, um, uh, the unknot is concordant. Right, I drew a concordance from the un, between the unknot and the square knot earlier. Um, I didn't tell you this, but um, the unknot, the, <coughs> the, the chain complex just looks like the ground ring with trivial differential. And knot flow homology detects the unknot. So the unknot is, in fact, the only knot whose chain complex just consists of the ground ring. But there's concordances between the unknot to you know, other more complicated knots. Um, so yeah, this thing, in particular, in, in general, this thing is not going to be an isomorphism. Uh, just on the chain complex itself. This is going to be an isomorphism on this localized thing. Great. All right. Um, OK. So this is great, and this strong statement is very useful. But as I mentioned earlier, yes. Yeah, are not so oriented, and so the surfaces better be oriented so that the oriented boundary matches up with the with the knot. Yes. Great. Okay. So, um, F of U and U V. It's not a PID, so maybe that's not great. So, uh, maybe it's hard to work with. Um, okay. So, uh, great. So remember, Mark. F of join UV, not a PID, but well, if you set one of your variables, say V equal to zero, is. OK. And so, um, right, as I mentioned earlier, well, you can define this is invariant H of K minus. That's just the homology of this chain complex when you've set v equal to 0. OK, right, so um, this, this thing has a grading. This is a z graded by um, the u grading. OK, so in particular, well, this is, this is a finitely generated module over a PID. So we have this structure theorem that it's always going to look like um, a free part plus some torsion part. Um, this is a finitely generated graded module over a PID. So it's always going to, oh, and in fact, um, it always has exactly one 
one free part. Um, that's because it's a knot in S3. So it's always going to have this form. Yeah, so the question in chat is HFK minus of K always the HF minus of Y of some three manifold Y, like the example I showed today. Um, I, uh, I'm not positive of the answer, um, but maybe no, I actually don't know. Uh, it's sort of a tough question, sort of which, which of these modules can be realized or not. Um, maybe if I, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, okay. That's right, yeah, so we said V equal, to, yeah, we said V, right, so remember when we said V equal to one, that's saying, okay, well now you can cross the Z base point and it's like the Z base point isn't there. When you set V equal to zero, that's like saying the Z base point is like a big like do not cross zone. Like don't like, so disks that used to cross Z, now you say when you, when you set V equal to zero, it's saying don't count those anymore. Good. Okay. All right. So So now, now let me define for you um, an invariant tau of k. So this is going to be um, minus one half. That's just some normalization convention. The maximum uh, u grading of an element x where uh, x is in HFK minus of K and uh, U to the N acting on X is non-zero uh, for all of, say, large N. Okay. And maybe, maybe if you did the exercise from last lecture where I asked you to check that D was well-defined, maybe, maybe this should look kind of familiar. <clears throat> Great. Um, so an exercise for you to check is that um, show that the grading of one in HFK minus of K in here uh, is minus two tau of K. So certainly, if you already have this splitting here, right, and you look, remember U has grading minus two, so if you look for the highest graded thing such that, um, like any, any amount of U acting on it is non-zero. Well, this part's all U torsion, so it can't come from here. And you want the highest weighted piece, and U has degree minus two, so it's gonna be the element one in here. Um, so I guess I'm doing the exercise for you. Uh, great, so this is, so it means that this has to, and because of this weird normalization, this has to be in grading uh, minus two tau. And then, great, okay. So, so if, you, if you have some, what, some splitting, you can just look at the grading of one in here. But if you don't have a splitting, you can just use this definition. All right. And so, great. So I've defined right now what is just 
are not invariant, but um, it's a theorem uh, due to Oshroff and Szabo, although I guess the way I'm telling this story, uh, it, it's a corollary of the Zemke result that I put on the board, but the Zemke result was sort of proved later. Um, great, so it's a theorem of Oshroff and Szabo that tau, um, it's a concordance invariant, so if two knots are concordant, they have the same value of tau, but even stronger, it's a homomorphism from the not concordance group uh, to the integers. So, um, that being a homomorphism, concordance homomorphism is stronger than being a concordance invariant. In particular, um, it uh, respects uh, connected sums. Um, oh, and moreover, uh, I, this is a, in fact, surjective homomorphism. Great. Questions? So the question was, is it easy to see that slice knots should get mapped to zero? Um, I guess it depends on your definition of easy, right? right? So <laughs> you should just check that, well, um, if, you, if you, from the, from the Zemke result, um, it's, it's an exercise to check that indeed, if a knot's concordance has an unknot, tau better be zero. Other questions? Okay, so we have this example of the trefoil on the board, so let's compute tau of the trefoil. Okay, so wait, what, what, was, what did I say to do? To compute tau, I said set uh, v equal to zero. Great, so we're going to set, uh, great, so let's set v equal to zero. Great, so this part goes away. All right, so then HFK minus HFK minus of the right hand trefoil. Okay, so well, what's in the kernel? A and C are in the kernel. And what's in the image of the boundary? Well, UA is in the image. Right, and this is all this is all over F I join U. Great. Okay. So wait. Well the C the C generates like a, a free sum end, right? Because there's no C appearing down here. Uh, I guess I'll uh, I'll write this. Right, this is generated by C. And then well, we're going to get an F join U mod U, and this is generated by A. But I guess the, the th part that we care about is you care about the grading of this, right? And we care about the U grading of this part. And so C was in U grading minus 2. So this, the element 1 in here is in grading minus 2. I'll make that larger. And so by the normalization over there, this tells us um, that tau of the right-handed trefoil is 1. Questions about that? No questions. Great. Okay, so, so let's see how, how the Zemke result implies that tau is a concordance invariant. So, um, proof that tau is a um, subjective homomorphism. So I guess the first step is that, so first we want to prove that um, it's a concordance invariant. Okay. 
Great. So if k0 is concordant to k1, right, we had this Zemke result where, well, tau, tau is defined where we set v equal to 0. So we can just set v equal to 0 in the Zemke result. So uh, set v equal 0 in Zemke. Great, so this is going to tell us that there exists a rating preserving um, F adjoin U equivariant G maps. Right, um, since we can turn a concordance around, we get them in both directions. So we get a map, say, F this way and G this way. Great. And these induce isomorphisms um, once we've inverted U. Right? That's our only variable that we still have around. Um, Okay, so well, <coughs> let's think about what happens if we have, wait, so we know that H of K minus Okay, great, so I'll leave this part of the proof as an exercise. So check that the existence of F implies uh, that tau of k naught is uh, less than or equal to tau of k1. So the idea is, well, um, these are U equivariant maps. They induce isomorphisms when we've inverted U. So the key is to think about what has to happen on the free part of H of k minus. Right? Basically, the sketch of this is that the free part has to map, the free part of HFK minus of this side has to map non trivially to the free part here in a U equivariant way, and that's going to imply this inequality. Wait, okay, but we also have a map the other way, right? right? And uh, existence of G. implies that tau of k1 is less than or equal to tau of k0. So this shows that, well, this shows that tau is a concordance invariant. If k0 and k1 are concordant, well, then um, tau has to be the same. All right. And to show that this is um, a, wait, so, to show it's a concordance homomorphism also has to behave nicely under connected sum. So to see that uh, tau of k1 connects sum k2 is tau of k1 plus tau of k2. Um, uh, I said I was going to prove this, but I'll I'll state this as an exercise. <laughs> um, use, use the Kunis formula. Right, so the Kunis formula says that, well, the knot flow complex of the connected sum is a tensor product of the respective knot flow complexes. That still holds once you've set, once you set V equal to zero. And then um, I guess maybe there's, to understand sort of, Right, the, the, the statement for the Kunis formula is on the, on the chain level. And so um, you can either do things on the chain level or you can use some universal coefficients or something to sort of figure out what has to happen on the level of homology. But sort of the point is, well, for a tau, we just care about the sort of the free parts. And sort of when you tensor those free parts together, you, you, tau is additive. Um, so I've just sketched 
the exercise uh, question. Oh, yeah, yeah, so these, I, you get chain maps. They had a sense of the homology. That's right. Yeah, I guess the statement about the Koenig formula, the Koenig formula is stated on the chain level, and then that, um, uh, but, um, but since we're working over a polynomial ring, the um, tensor product, the homology of the tensor product isn't going to necessarily agree with the tensor product of the homologies. You get some Tor terms yeah, or something, yeah. yeah. But somehow, the Tor terms don't really affect this part that much because tau is just sort of a statement about like the free part, really. Great. All right, and then um, to show, right, so we want to show this the subjective homomorphism. Well, okay, let's just show that tau is surjective. Well, we already basically did that. Right, because we computed that tau of the trefoil is one, and we know that it's additive under connected sum. So, well, tau of uh, n times the right-handed trefoil is equal to n uh, for any n. Great. Okay, and so you can already see that, well, by setting v equal to zero, you know, we, we throw out some information, but we still get this really great concordance invariant. And so um, one thing that I spend a lot of time researching is, well, if you keep V, if you don't, like, if you don't set V equal to zero, you can actually get lots, of, lots more concordance homomorphisms. In fact, um, in work with uh, Irving Dai, Matt Stockigan, and Lin Truong, we showed that, well, <laughs> if you keep V and you do some algebra stuff, you can, in fact, get um, infinitely many more um, homomorphisms, subjective homomorphisms to the integers. In fact, they're linearly independent. Um, so if you're, if you're curious about that, I'd be happy to um, talk more about that. Um, but this is what I wanted to tell you about. Thanks. What is known about the structure of the concordance group? Great. So <coughs> um, it's infinitely generated. Um, there's two torsion, right? So uh, any knot that's negative amphichiral, i.e., isotopic to the reverse of its mirror image, is going to be um, torsion. And then you need to check that it's not already slice. So, um, but there are lots of non slice negative amphichiral knots, like starting with the figure eight. Um, Wait, so it's known that the concordance group, um, wait, so I guess, yeah, um, and there's, in, right, so there's sort of infinitely much two torsion, um, so uh, the sort of, the simplest thing the concordance group could be is this. That's like the, that's like the simplest thing it could be. Um, However, no one has obstructed, for example, like a Q subgroup. So no one can prove that, like, it seems hard to have a knot that's like infinitely divisible in this group, um, but no, no one has been able to obstruct that. Um, uh, so the question is, do we expect there to be other types of torsion? It probably depends on who you ask. Um, so, so Levine, um, Jerry Levine in the like, 50s defined a surjective homomorphism uh, to this group, um, which, which in higher odd dimensions is actually an isomorphism. Um, so by higher dimensions, I just mean, you know, knotted SNs and SN plus twos. And so in higher, in higher odd dimensions, you can define the analogous homomorphism and it's actually an isomorphism. In the classical dimension, so S1s and S3s, um, this has a non-trivial kernel, and all known examples of things that hit this part are infinite order. Oh, the question is, how do we know that HFK minus has rank one? Um, and that's an exercise from the fact that this is a knot in S3. Um, 
So if you have a knot, you can do this for null homologous knots in any three manifold, in which case it might not be the case that HFK minus has rank one. Ah, so the question was basically about the kernel of this homomorphism. Um, can you say things about the kernel of this homomorphism? Um, it's very non-trivial, big. Um, yeah. Ah, the question is, do we have a more geometrical description of this tau invariant? Um, not, not really. Um, uh, tau, it behaves nicely though in, in lots of ways. So for example, tau behaves nicely under crossing changes. So for example, if you do a crossing change, it can change tau by at most one, and the direction in which it can change depends on the sign of the crossing change. Oh, are we able to find a basis for the free part of the not concordance group? Um, you can find a basis. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you could just like right, ignore this part, um, and then you could you yeah. This this part relies on looking at um, uh, Levine Tristram signatures. So. Uh, I believe to show that this part is rejective, I think even like some family of Taurus knots probably works. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe I personally could not give you a basis, but I believe it's in the literature. <laughs> Um, the question was, could a period, periodic knot with, say, periodicity theory be sliced? Um, I haven't thought about periodic knots. Can anyone in the audience 